I'll start with the first one. Dr. Uh, McClellan, uh, we have talked quite a number of hours about this over the last few years. You seem very strongly convinced from your direct observations that President Kennedy was shot in the front of the table. Could you comment? Yes. Uh, is this? Yes, sir. Exactly You're okay. Uh, I was not as completely convinced that he was shot from the front until several years after the assassination. Uh, I saw the uh, Zapruder film for the first time uh, that had been made by Mr. Abraham Zapruder of the assassination. I came home one night from Parkman, and uh, my wife was watching the Geraldo Rivera show. And as I came in, she said, oh, come in quick, because Geraldo Rivera has got the copy of the Zapruder film, The Assassination, and he's about to show it. So I quickly went in and sat down in front of the TV set beside my wife, and they showed the picture of the Zapruder film, and first it was in regular motion, and then they showed it in slow motion. And it became apparent to me that, uh, as I'm sure maybe most everybody in this room has seen copies of all the Zapruder film when it's been run here and there in Thunder. And what happens, as uh, you will recall, is as the motorcade comes off of Houston Street onto uh, Elm Street, they look at the triple underpass. Uh, it looks like the President and Mrs. Kennedy are fine. Then just as they make that turn, uh, the President's hands go up to his neck like that, uh, as if something has happened. Uh, and then the motorcade proceeds slowly on down Elm Street toward the triple underpass and disappears for a few seconds behind a big sign that was there at the time along the edge of Elm Street. And then after a short you know, few seconds, it comes out from behind that sign, and the president's hands are still up to his neck. Only now, Mrs. Kennedy is leaning over to him uh, as if to ask him what's wrong. And just as she does that, the president's head explodes, and he's thrown violently backward and to the left. Uh, and it immediately struck me then that the bullet that had killed him had been fired from behind the picket fence on the grassy knoll. Um, and I think that that's still in my mind what happened, although that was not uh, what was said by the Warren Commission. So that all the bullets were fired from the sixth floor of the book depository. And indeed, I think one of them, uh, as near as I can put it together, the first uh, bullet that caused him to raise his hands up to his neck uh, went through his high and his back and out his neck so that this, instead of being an entrance wound, may have been an exit wound. Now, that's just my impression of it. Um, and then, uh, as he proceeded on down toward the triple underpass, uh, then he was struck by the other bullet, uh, probably entering somewhere around the hairline on the right side of his head and going out the back of his skull. Uh, it's often like brought up, well, did you see that entrance wound that I just described? And no, I did not. I'm just assuming, and that's all I'm doing, is assuming that that's where that bullet that came out the back of his head must have entered. Now, the reason we didn't see it is because, first of all, we didn't have time to go over his body after he was pronounced dead. His hair was uh, very thick, as you, everybody recalls, and it was matted and covered with blood which obscured probably the site of the bullet entry. At least that's my kind of reconstruction of that as best I can uh, make it. And Dr. McClellan, the other thing is, it's interesting, I'm not a conspiracy theorist per se, but another small thing like a few observations differentially. One of the things we do with Secret Service is, you know, like when we've done motorcade survival <coughs> courses, is that you never do a thing that takes a lot of time to slow you down and go into a certain area. Where you don't. So that's for example, going down to Houston, which is now one way this way. At that time, they were coming down to Houston, and then they had to take that really acute angle this way. You really right. have to slow down. That's right. It makes you think that somebody know that's where they're going to really slow down yeah. at that point in time. That's right. I think so. Right. That's where the bullet was fired, I think, from the sixth floor yeah. of the book depository. So if you know, now you just it's something you would never do. So, in other words, I don't know if they learned from that lesson, or is this someone actually knew that that's the kind of thing that would happen ahead of time? So. Now you had a question over here, I think Fiona had a question. Is that right? Oh, you didn't? Okay, I thought I was the one. Oh, you're helping with the whites, I see. We had a question in the back over there. 
Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Doctors McClellan and Duke, thanks so much for sharing these amazing stories. Uh, obviously, a huge piece of uh, American history that we're all in here firsthand. Uh, I have a little bit more of, uh, I guess, practical or, or clinical and ethical question for Dr. McClellan. Uh, we've all probably in this room at one time or another been required to treat someone who's just committed a crime or suspected of doing so. Um, how do you reconcile having to treat Oswald after having to treat the president just a day or so earlier, if you had time to think about that at all? Well, that's a good question. And the answer that I would give is that I think you just react. You don't really have time or the, the inclination to think. You just go into the reaction mode. And you don't think about who this person is or how I should be feeling about them. You just do what looks like needs to be done without any further thought on that. Great. Yeah. Another question? Yeah. Any other questions? Just do it. Just do it. <laughs> do you have any other questions? Yes, the other question there, Tom. Can you get a microphone for him? Mic him up. Just a quick question about Oswald. Uh, I know that when he was shot in the police station, uh, O'Neill Funeral Home uh, was on an ambulance call of duty that day, and they came in with their two attendants. And uh, when they loaded him on the, the, the cot, loaded him in the back, there were several uh, police officers that jumped in the back of Ford Fairlane Station Wagon, which was the ambulance at the time. Uh, the ambulance attendant that should have been attending in the back, there was no room for him, obviously, so he went around to the front seat. And so there was basically nobody in the back, nobody attending to Oswald. And there would have to be a film crew at Parkland when they rolled in. And it showed them bringing him out of the ambulance to go into the emergency department. And his clothes were still intact. Nobody touched him, it sounds like. And it really begs the question, you know, I, I'd be curious how much blood you actually found in his abdomen and his if that changed your thoughts about hypotensive resuscitation and not pumping people full of fluids, that he was still had vital signs, it sounds like he was right. Right. Well, uh, he had good blood. Oswald, when you were uh, asking about Oswald, whether how much blood there was in his abdomen, uh, really he had a huge hematoma back around those vessels, but it was contained by the rectal peritoneal tissues overlying. That's why he didn't just bleed out on the scene. It really kind of strange that he didn't, but there wasn't that much free blood in his abdomen. And so Dr. Shires was able to work down toward this injury and was just about to get to the point where he could put clamps on when he was all arrested. So. Do you think that, you think that uh, dis disruption of the clot might have led to the sudden cardiac arrest? And very likely did. Yeah, very likely did. Uh, one, one other quick point. In. Another. Let me, ask, let me ask a question. Yes, yes. Does anybody know by what means Oswald got out of, you know, was loaded in the jail and got back out of the car? You know, in those days, there, there wasn't nothing like this. There was no MS. And, uh, you know, I've never seen an uh, EMT, much less a Michael Andrews, if I went back to Houston in 72. They used to come to Parkland in a private car in a taxi with clear plastic seat covers in the back to keep the blood off, or in a hearse driven by a funeral home attendant. That's sort of what this was, was it not? I mean, it was. Is that what he's saying? Yes. I'm the yeah. yes. yeah. It was in a... Somebody's <laughs> here, sorry, but the blind and the lame to get pissed off with a snippy. There's also another very obscure fact that only this gentleman here really knows, which is Dr. McClellan uh, took care of Kennedy. He assisted Dr. Duke in operating on Connolly, and then there was one other individual. You weren't in there at Connolly, were you? I helped operate his uh, oh, leg. Yeah, that's right. And then there was one other individual you operated on years later. Oh, yeah. There's some odd coincidences about this whole thing. Uh, might, before I mention what you're referring to, um, two years before this happened, uh, when I was still, uh, you know, early in my career at Parkland. Yeah. Uh, my wife, who had been working over at Baylor Hospital, uh, helping to take care of Mr. Raymond, who had been brought down here for treatment uh, at uh, Baylor Hospital. Well, I never went to Baylor Hospital, but my wife uh, was working over there 
and she called me up in Parkland and said, uh, I forgot to pick up my check today uh, at Mayor. Could you go by on your way home and pick up my check? I said, sure, I'll do that. So I took it off a little early, drove over to Baylor, where I, as I said, I never went before, and parked my car and walked across Gaston Avenue to Baylor. And as I was walking across that street, I saw three uh, motorcycle cops coming toward me, leading a, a group of three long black limousines. And uh, I thought, well, hmm, what if what that is? And continued on across the street to the side entrance that was present there in Baylor at that time. And the motorcade and the motorcycle cops and I all arrived at the side entrance at the same time. And I was standing by the curb as the lead uh, limousine pulled up adjacent to me and I was standing by the rear door. A uh, motorcycle cop got off his motor motorcycle, came back and asked me quietly to step back out of the way so he could open the rear door of the limousine. And I did, and I stepped John Kennedy. And I could have leaned over and patted him on the back. This was two years before I was seeing him in the emergency room. At, uh, Incredible coincidence. And then, then the other thing that you're talking about, several years later, I got a call from a friend of mine, a surgeon at Presbyterian <coughs> Hospital, who had operated on a patient for gastric cancer that day, and was concerned that he was not doing well and thought he needed re exploring He wanted to know if I could come out and help him do the re exploration later that evening. I said, yes, I would. And I went out there and walked into the uh, operating room and asked the nurse in charge there. I said, what room are we operating in? And who is it? She said, I don't know who it is. She said, it's, look back, I think it's in room five. So I went back on the board and went back to room five and it said the patient's name was Mr. A. Zapruder, who had taken the phone <laughs> of his So, so of the Zapruder take, Dr. Lovell and also operated on the other So, amazing. I like it. You, 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 you. <laughs> <laughs> I think this wonderful session deserves one more round of applause.